Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by 818 Tequila, delicious and smooth tequila, made in harmony with the earth. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. This episode is brought to you by Bento Box, a full-service marketing and commerce platform that helps restaurants get discovered, make more money, and engage their diners. Join over 8,000 restaurants already using Bento Box today to deliver better hospitality. Visit getbento.com slash chef today to get your first month free. That's getbento.com slash chef. Welcome to Spill and Dish, a new podcast from the Specialty Food Association. Founded in 1952, SFA is the leading trade association and source of information about the $170 billion specialty food industry. We champion the food producers, retailers, and other buyers who make up the specialty food world. Each episode, we want to share the stories behind the products made and sold by our members who are helping shape the future of food. You can listen and discover the inspiration, recipe, craft, culture, ingredients, and production methods that help answer the question, what makes specialty food special? I'm today's host, Julie Gallagher, Director of Content at SFA. We're excited to bring you today's episode and so happy to be working with Heritage Radio Network, a nonprofit podcast network covering the world of food, drink, and agriculture, and expanding the way eaters think about food. Today's guest is... Stephen Caldwell, chef and founder of Swiss Rosti. Hi, Stephen. I'm so excited to be speaking with you today, and I wish you had brought one of your signature products with you so I could try it. Hi, Uh, Julie. Thanks for having me. Sure. So what is a Rosti? Well, a Swiss Rosti, uh, the way we have created it, is a crispy, shredded, filled potato. And if you uh, envision a tater tot about four or five times that size with a filling. and But the story starts a couple of hundred years ago in Switzerland where wives would shred potatoes because they had a, a bunch of them and they were cheap. They would actually hold leftovers from supper the night before and then they would fry these shredded potatoes or hash browns. They would fill them with whatever they had left over from supper, whether it was meats and cheeses and vegetables. Then they would cover them with another layer of shredded potatoes. They would fry them on both sides and it would sustain the men in the fields all day as well as a comfort food, right, that would bring family and friends around the table. So that's in a nutshell what a Swiss Rosti is. Wow, that sounds amazing. So when did you first discover them and how did you come to love them? I was involved in another company completely outside of food and I had an office in South America for several years. I was down there and one of my joint venture partners had asked me over for dinner before I was to head back to the States. I had asked what we were having for dinner and he said, you know what, we wanted to spend more time with you. So we actually uh, found a company that had been advertising on the radio that day called Signor and Signora Batata. 
Mr. and Mrs. Potato. So they came over and did exactly as I had described, where they were shredding potatoes, frying them, filling with different fillings and covering them and, uh, and then cutting them. And it resonated with me. I'd eaten at many different places around the world in my other travels and being a foodie, I would find the craziest things really make a mental effort to remember what was in those and then bring them home and then recreate them for friends and family. But when I tasted this, I just stopped in my tracks. It was so simple and so delicious, I had to know more. So upon my return to uh, Portland, I started researching and I actually found out that it had Swiss roots, as I had mentioned before. So as I contacted these two chefs that I ate from who had this company, they started talking to me that one of them was actually an engineer that spent nine years in Switzerland and ate these every single day. Wow. His cousin, who had just graduated from culinary school, wanted to know what he should do with his degree. And the cousin that spent that much time in Switzerland said, I know exactly what we're going to do. And they started filling shredded potatoes. So that's how it all started. Okay. And so what had you been doing before you got into this business? I've been in sales and marketing all of my life, and I was representing a heavy equipment company. Uh, but still, my passion since the age of five has been food. Okay. So heavy equipment wasn't your passion. It was not my passion. It <laughs> paid the bills, but it wasn't my passion. Okay, great. Um, let's see. So what was there anything that you learned in your past career that you think helps you now run a food business? Um, most definitely, Julie. Uh, it's been my relationship building with customers uh, in country and out of country, my ability to communicate and really dig deep to the passions and uh, um, and and just feelings of other people and what they've done with their own businesses and how they brought them to market. I looked at that as an opportunity. And then when I found this, I thought, you know what? I can do this. And at that time, I was 55 years old. That was three years ago. And I said, you know, I, I'm going to do this. And we, I just woke up one morning and told my wife, today we start Swiss Rosti. And that's how it happened. And then did you work with the Oregon State University Food Innovation I Center? Did. I did. I worked directly with uh, Sarah Massoni, who was just a gem. I mean, New York Times, uh, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the million dollar palette for bringing specialty foods to yep. market. She reached out to me in May of 2018. And she said, are you Stephen Caldwell? I said, yes, I am. She says, I hear you're trying to fill a potato. I said, yes, I am. And where we live is about a mile from the Food Innovation Center. So because of their schedule, we kept getting pushed back. So by October of 2018, that's when we went into ideation. And I told Sarah, I said, Sarah, I'm not doing anything else. I promise I will work with you every single day with your team, but I need to be at your winter tasting event. She said, well, that's only eight weeks away and you're asking for five flavors and us to develop it. I said, no hill for a climber. Can we do this? And she said, absolutely. So at, from the Food Innovation Center, eight weeks later, we launched these at their winter tasting event. There was over 50 entrepreneurs that had developed uh, you know, different foods and uh, uh, different products there. Everybody else was gone by 8 o'clock when it closed, and I had a line out the door from our table. And the very next morning, I had two vendor agreements in my email totaling 31 stores in Portland that wanted to carry it the very next day. Wow. Did you anticipate that it would be so easy, or wasn't it as easy as it sounds? It was not as easy as it sounds. Reverse, I when I first discovered it and I got home, I started blogging because I knew that it wasn't just as easy as shredding a potato. I happened to be lucky enough to connect with, an, with a chef out of Switzerland, and he was at that time in his late 70s. He agreed to give me all of his knowledge on how to prepare the potatoes, how to process them, how to do everything in the recipe of what a Swiss Rosti is, because it takes from start to finish to be able to use the potato, and it's this one particular varietal out of hundreds, two days to process. So it took me months and months and thousands of uh, hours and pounds in the kitchen to finally develop how to process the potato before I even went into the Food Innovation Center. And I'll tell you, Julie, at some point I was like, I don't even know if I can keep going because I'm stuck at the potato part. But we figured it out. We were able to commercialize it. And Sarah just did magical work with her team at the Food Innovation Center to get us to that next level. 
And six weeks after the uh, winter tasting event in December of 2018, we were in Incubator Village in 2019 uh, in a little two-foot booth at the Specialty Food Association, Fancy Food in San Francisco. We made 750 by hand, froze them, brought them down, Lori cut them in quarters, and we ran out within two hours of the end of the show. Um, and we got best new product, and it was absolutely amazing. Oh wow! You got the Sophie best new product. I did award? not get the Sophie award; just best in uh, from the, everybody at Incubator Village. Oh, okay. And it was at that show that we signed Whole Foods. That's amazing. And I still didn't even know where I was going to make him yet commercially. Did they just come and stop by Incubator Village and talk to you? It was at the time. It was Alex Hickey, who's the category uh, global category manager for uh, for Whole Foods out of Austin. It was Denise Braley and their whole team. All regions came up to the booth. They tasted it, and Alex Hickey, who just recently retired, uh, said it was the most innovative potato she has ever tasted. And looked at me and said, this is Denise Braley, the Pacific Northwest Forager. You're going to go into the 21 stores first. And within two years, you will be global. Mark my words. And within 23 months, this is last June of 2021, we went global with Whole Foods. Wow, that's incredible. Now, you seem like such a networker. Like you got linked up with all of the right people to make this happen. To what do you attribute that? Are you just a positive person what do you, what's your secret? First and foremost, yes. Uh, my wife uh, will will ad- admit that to a fault, that even when what appears the sky's falling and things aren't coming into place, I wake up every morning, I put a smile on my face, and I say, this is going to be a great day. And I really go back to what my father taught me when I was a kid. Facts tell, stories sell. I can give everybody a lot of data on how potatoes are doing in the frozen set and this and that. But it really comes down to the story that I found out of Switzerland 200 years ago. I actually coined the phrase Swiss meets West. It wasn't something that I did or invented. It's just something that I felt so passionate about. I just knew I had to bring it to market because if all of my friends and family loved it, I just was really hoping that other people would too. Yeah. So tell me, what are some of the most popular um, varieties? I got to tell you, the first and foremost is what we refer to as the classic. It's the melty raclette. We actually import the raclette cheese from Switzerland uh, because we wanted to be true to their roots. I had a lot of cheese companies reach out to me domestically. And I got to tell you, we have the, some of the best domestic cheeses I've ever tasted. Um, but I really wanted to import it. I wanted to use the South Hill facing cow milk, you know, raclette that they're truly known for. And I did. And I got to tell you, it's, it, does it cost me more? Yes, it does. But what it did for the relationship that I've built with people from Switzerland or from Europe, um, I really am very humbled to say that they're saying you've really nailed it. I can't believe somebody from the U.S. It took somebody from the U.S. to fill a potato with our raclette cheese um, and do what you've done. And that is just, it, again, it just humbles me so much. So that is our really our classic. Then the other ones that we have in store nationally are our Melty 3 cheese, which is an incredible blend of mozzarella, Parmesan, and sharp cheddar, which is absolutely delectable. And then we have our, our stuffed baked potato. That really resonates with most people throughout the country because it's got all the usual suspects that mom used to make. It's got the sour cream, the cream cheese, the chives, and just enough coarse cracked pepper finish that just brings it home. And every time you either put them in the air fryer or the oven, it starts to just, you know, give all those amazing aromas in your kitchen. And most of the comments we get from the consumers that, uh, that give us feedback from our, from our packaging, when we ask if you have any comments or questions, please call me or email me. And it all comes directly to me. Most of them say our friends and family thought they were homemade. So they're that rustic look right out of the freezer into the oven or air fryer. And they're, they really are very special. And what, are, what sort of eating occasions are people using these for? You know what? Uh, we did a demographic. That's a great question. Last year, we really spent some time over six to eight weeks in early summer to figure out who's buying them and when they're eating them. 
And um, it didn't surprise me because Lori and I have five kids. And in developing, they were coming home from school and they were always asking for Rosties like as an after school snack. Mm -hmm. So that's really first and foremost. Um, and really the call outs, believe it or not, they're, uh, they're certified gluten free, non GMO, they're currently vegetarian. And they're two and a half ounces each, so they're quite big, but they're only 120 calories or less. So moms love that. So it's getting them the, their children the vegetables as well as some good call-outs, and it's really good. But side of plate or cutting them in half for hors d'oeuvres, appetizers, uh, the big game, um, they just love to pull them out of the freezer uh, and then just pop them in the oven. Uh, top them with sour cream, dip them in a fry sauce or a sour cream or a uh, ranch sauce. They're just really versatile. And with that raclette, um, we have people doing it all the time where they top them with a poached egg at Easter or special occasions or brunches with hollandaise sauce. And you've got a rosty Benedict with a surprise inside when that cheese just starts to run out after you cut it. So it's really all over the board. Every single day part can, uh, you know, really resonates with Rosti. Tell me about um, COVID and how that affected your business. Well, it has been, um, it's been an experience that, uh, and of course, we're not the only ones. Um, it was really re challenging because we rely on the opportunity to present to people, right? Mm -hmm. Like Fancy Food Show always been our most favorite show of the year uh, in San Francisco and New York and then, of course, in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, and when we couldn't do that, we had to switch gears. And we were doing in-store in, uh, tasting as well. And that all went away. Right. So we immediately went to social media. We immediately started uh, posting videos of how good they taste and getting comments from children to adults and everybody in between to do everything we could to describe the flavor the crunch, the experience of them. Um, but it's been a challenge. Um, and then supply chain, logistics. I mean, uh, you know, uh, when we went with Whole Foods nationally, we immediately, without promo, started selling 15 to 20 uh, a week in, in different stores in the Northeast and the Midwest. Um, and then, you know, trucks get lost and we don't have inventory on shelves. But I have been absolutely blessed to be surrounded by a team that I've been able to assemble in the last three years. I've got, I've got an operations manager in Chicago, 33 years Procter & Gamble with skill sets that I don't have. Uh, Cheryl was 25 years with Kroger, retired, tasted it. Uh, was introduced through a friend of a friend. She came on board, came out of retirement, and she had a handle on a lot of other things that had to do with sales and and uh, and uh, distribution channels. Um, a COO that was with Pepsi and Frito Lay that was able to lend his expertise to make connections to be able to keep everything moving. It has really it has been more than me. I tell people I just happen to be the one that filled a potato. What I've been able to do is really connect with people that had the same feeling I did when I tasted it for the first time that I was able to attract. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the real heroes that have been able to, uh, you know, weed through the noise and really keep everything moving. And now to be able to, you know, be able to be, be back doing shows, putting in their mouths, because when I was doing, when Lori and I do in-store tastings, as soon as we put it in their mouth, the whole store sells out. Every single time we do a hot tasting, the store sells out. So we know that it resonates. So taste equals sales. So we just continue to navigate every single day to figure out how we can keep reaching our customers. That's great. Now, I know the business hasn't been around for a ton of years, but is there anything looking back that you might have changed if you can go back? If I went back... Um, I was extremely uh, optimistic, and that's what got me to Incubator Village at Fancy Food January 2019. I would uh, I would have spent more time in the raw material sourcing. I, there's because of the uh, the potatoes and some of the ingredients we use are commodities. I really didn't educate myself as I now feel I could have done at the time um, to figure out where, uh, you know, uh, when we didn't have a great crop, 
uh, and building more relationships with other growers to be able to source easier, uh, more of the same varietal. If it wasn't the specific one we needed to use, we could use others. Um, but today, I mean, I always use, you know, what, you know, I always say, uh, I wish I knew, you know, now what I didn't know then. And this, you know, it, it's just one of those things. It lends to our success in a way because I can look back and say, okay. So what took me two years to do up until a year ago, I'm now doubling what I've been able to do just in the last year by going back and kind of fixing these things. Of course, it's the team that I've also assembled that have lent their uh, expertise as well that I didn't have from the beginning, which is amazing. Do you source the potatoes here from the U.S.? We do. Okay. Yeah, from Oregon, uh, mostly from Oregon. Oh, that's great. Yeah. What do you want people to know about your brand that they might not know already? What I would like people to know about our brand is that, number one, we are everyday people. We're a husband and wife team uh, with five kids that... um, we're focused and passionate about bringing something that we loved to other people's tables. And as we grow, we want everybody to know that, and I, I hope they see it and it resonates on social media when they see all of our posts that we're so you know, crazily doing all the time, just to let them know that um, we're normal people. And we just happen to take that leap of faith, take that first step. Um, and that they can, you know, they have our, our, you know, our stamp, you know, and our commitment to them that they're going to have, you know, a great experience. Um, they can always reach out to us. Um, and we rely on them because that's, what's building our business and taking care of our family. How old are your children? They range. Uh, I have one son. He was the first one. He's 29. And then I have four daughters behind him. So I have a 27-year-old daughter, a 26-year-old daughter, a 18-year-old daughter, and a 17-year-old daughter. Oh, I'm one of five as well. And there are four girls and one boy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're almost out of time. But before you go, we'd like for you to participate in our final segment, Take 5, where we have five questions for our guests. First, let's pause for a break. I'm Chava Perivan, co-host of Agave Road Trip on HRN here to talk about 818 Tequila. 818 creates their tequila using traditional methods that a family own and operate distillery in Jalisco, Mexico. From the blue agave they grow to their recycled glass bottle, 818 emphasizes the Earth's importance in all they do. Their distillery runs on biomass and solar power, which means they don't rely as much on fossil fuels and are able to reduce their carbon footprint. Their labels, corks, and boxes are all certified by the Forest Stewardship Council as coming from sustainability-managed forests. 81A is a proud member of 1% for the Planet, through which they support HRN as well as Sacred, my organization in Jalisco, where together we transform agave byproducts and water waste into adobe bricks that are donated to local infrastructure projects, like a local library in Zapotitlan de Vadillo. Visit drink818.com to learn more about their sustainability efforts and find 818 near you. 818 has been part of so many magical nights for me, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhattan, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. In the heart of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Lilia combined wood-fired seafood, handcrafted pasta, classic Italian cocktails, and warm hospitality. Since 2016, it's been celebrated as a neighborhood gathering place, bringing the best of Italy to New York City. Lilia is one of over 8,000 restaurants that leverage bento box to power their digital front door, including their website, gift cards, event management, and more. Bento Box is a marketing and commerce platform built specifically for the hospitality industry. With Bento Box, get discovered, make more money, and engage your diners so you can deliver great hospitality both in person and online. Visit getbento.com chef 
today to learn more and get your first month free. That's getbento.com slash chef. Okay, here are your five questions for our final segment, take five. What's your favorite thing about the specialty food industry? The familial, the family, um, the commitment to bringing entrepreneurs that have created incredible uh, products that has the SFA uh, support to assist them in every way to help bring them to market. And what would you say is your biggest gripe about the industry? The biggest gripe about the industry, it's tough because I'm super positive. Um, The biggest gripe about the specific, the specialty food industry? Yes. The biggest gripe, I, gosh, I can't pick one. Okay. I don't have a gripe. That's fair. If you weren't running a business, what would you be doing? I would be a chef. Okay. And what's the one piece of advice you'd give a new food business? Do your homework. Research the industry. Specifically research your placement and the category that you're looking to launch it in. And really, and then reach out to competitors of yours because like the SFA, I have never been in an industry that there are so many people that want to help you because all the other industries I've ever been in, it just doesn't happen that way. So don't be afraid to reach out and make the connections, even if they may be a potential competitor. Okay. And how do you define specialty food? I des- I define specialty food as a uh, as a creation, typically... Um, that comes from an idea that didn't come from a great big company. It came from people like Lori and I, where we had something, we couldn't find it anywhere. We said, you know what, let's do this and then follow through. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. You can find out more about this show at specialtyfood.com and heritageradionetwork.org. And remember to follow wherever you get your podcasts. Come back often to get to know the people who are shaping the future of food. Special thanks to Stephen Caldwell and to Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. This is Spill and Dish, a Specialty Food Association podcast. This show is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had Those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then, like, how how that all came to be and realize, like, wow, like, this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Five.